Okay, I'd like to call our meeting to order tonight, and uh, this is a recess meeting from our previous meeting on May the 11th. And at this time, uh, Mr. Simmons, we will ask you to give the invocation, and before you do, uh, we lost a teacher assistant, Miss Tracy Lindsey Britt, from uh, Long Branch uh, the weekend, and we would just ask that we pause for a moment of silence, and then Mr. John, if you would, uh, please lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we come to you as humble as we can, asking for your grace and your mercy. Lord, that you, we ask that you bless the Britt family during this time. You don't make no mistakes. You want to pick the best flower. Sometimes we want to question why, but you know what's best, Lord. We ask that you be with them. We ask that you bless this meeting, everyone that's here. We ask that you let us make decisions that's best for our school system. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Next item is the adoption of the agenda. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Mr. Randy. Mr. Craig, I'd like to add to the agenda graduation procedures and guidelines. Okay. Graduation procedures and guidelines. Be added. That's a motion by Mr. Lawson. Do I have a second? Second. A motion by Mr. Lawson, second by Ms. Brenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Let's add that to the end of the information items up under Esther 2 and Esther 3. Add it at that point. Okay. Now, do I have a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So, um, second. Motion by Dr. Emanuel. Ms. Brenda, a motion by Ms. Brenda and a second by Mr. Lawson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Information items uh, school extension, learning recovery, and enrichment programs. Uh, Dr. Sandra Evans and uh, Mr. Zach Jones. I come to you this evening with some very good news. The Office of Learning Recovery has given us notification that our plan was approved on May 17th. So that's very good news, that, and I just wanted to share that with you this evening. We'll have a presentation this evening. Uh, Mr. Zach's going to go over our case literacy session. Um, I do want to go over some things with you first, and that is the Public Schools of Washington County's remediation and enrichment programs are going to deliver this summer a very specific curriculum in a condensed period of time. And we all know that condensed period of time is six weeks, emphasizing the mastery of the student's individual efficiency, efficiency, I'm sorry, and the overviews of our goals are to provide in-person instruction to increase academic growth due to the loss of instructional time for all students in pre K. <coughs> By law, we were asked to do this K 12, but we chose to include our pre K. I want to share another bit of news with you guys. We have asked, and we have a partnership now with Southside Ashpole Elementary, and we will be including Southside Ashpole in our. Uh, summer Learning and Enrichment Camp. Uh, Dr. Head is working with us on that, and she's sending over information, and since we work closely with them, and they will be joining us for two years anyway, those are our students. So I'm very happy that those students are going to be joining us this summer, and they will be coming to our sites as well. Also, we hope to build confidence and a positive attitude for students due to a lack of social interaction. We know that our students did not have the social interactions this year. Uh, Mr. Zach's going to give you some numbers to tell you how many remain virtual, but it was about half this year. So half of our students did not have the virtual, did not have that face-to-face -face interaction that we hoped they would have. So this summer, we're hoping that they will have that. We're hoping to extend our school year and to provide our EC 
EPL students with the support to assist any English language development instruction that they may need. You guys know, and we've gone over in depth, our House Bill 82 guidelines. Those guidelines say that instruction shall be delivered for at least 150 hours or 30 days over the course of the program. I'm not going to read that to you, but I am going to let you know that we went with 150 hours for our elementary and 30 days for our high school. And our timelines are six weeks, Monday through Thursday. And the days are once again, 150 hours, we're doing 24 days, June 14th through 25th, and July 6th through 30th, that's for our elementaries. And our student day is 8 o'clock to 3.30, and the teacher day is 7.30 to 4 o'clock. Good evening again, Dr. Good evening. Hanson and Chairman Lowry. We're going to briefly discuss what our data mm -hmm. says. So if we look at slide six, Cole, we reached out to all of our principals over the last two days. We have 11,437 students who remain virtual this year, which like Dr. Evans alluded to is 52% of our student population. So 48% of our students are in the building, but those 50, that 52% remains virtual. So it's very important that we get those students back face-to-face -face this summer. We also looked at the percentage of students who attended online. So that's really the heart of why we are doing, one of the reasons why we are going with uh, the Summer Learning and Enrichment Program, because uh, if I look at my numbers correctly, we only had about 16.2% of our students online, 75% or more of the time. So it's very important that we get our students back in the building, back face to face, so that we can recover some of that learning loss. We also reached out to our principals on slide, the next slide, oh, thank you. There have been extensive, there's been extensive outreach from the school level to our students. Uh, this is a very comprehensive list, but the majority of our principals and their support staff have reached out with letters, phone calls, home visits, uh, thrill share through our social media. Canvas were the main <clears throat> outreach uh, method. Now, if we transition to our seniors, we met with the curriculum committee yesterday and we spent a lot of time talking about our seniors. We reached out to every high school principal. As of today, we have 245 seniors who are currently not on track to graduate by June 4th. However, if those seniors do attend summer uh, learning and enrichment camp, they do that credit recovery or whatever they need to do, then 228 seniors will graduate during the June, uh, excuse me, the end of summer graduation ceremony. So we close the gap tremendously if the students are able to attend. Uh, and our next slide, the number of students who <coughs> did not participate at all this school year, virtually. So we're, we're looking for new students. We know where they are, but they're not participating. And we have 739. Broke that down by elementary, middle, and high school. And Dr. Evans is going to be personnel. <coughs> do, do we have questions now, or do you want us to wait? I'm sorry. We, ha we have a question. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to refer to Ms. Thompson when it comes to personnel, but I do want to let you guys know that our plan calls for a 1 to 10 ratio for teachers and a 1 to 9 student to adult ratio. 
Please recognize that that adult ratio can include for the plant, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, TAs, the teachers, it's anybody in the building. And we're also hoping to employ at least one teacher assistant for, and for every 20 students in K-3 as well as EC. Uh, you guys are going to have personnel, I think, forwarded to you later on this evening. And I think uh, Ms. Thompson is going to be able to answer those questions for you later. Unless you have any questions. Okay. All right. And this is a very quick overview of our curriculum for specifically for kindergarten through eighth grade. You should have received a scope and sequence in your packet that was provided by curriculum and associates. We at CIA, we have looked at that document more closely. We've also looked at the stand, the, uh, excuse me, the testing specs for our NCEOG. We've also looked at the testing specs for the Read to Achieve Alternative Assessment. And we also looked at the priority instructional content that was released to help our students make the most gains this school year. So we have tweaked the scope and sequence a bit. We also, uh, our assessments, our K-8 students will take the iReady diagnostics, diagnostic assessments at the beginning and the end of camp. Our, read to, our third grade students who qualify will also take the read to achieve at the end of camp because that's one of their cause exemption pathways. All of the assessments will be administered online. And we will also have weekly formative assessments. That was a huge piece that came out of our meeting yesterday with the curriculum committee. Because not waiting until the end of camp to see how our, our instruction was, we need to assess. And then you have a outline of what those guides will look like for ELA. It's uh, very user friendly for our teachers. Essentially, they have to point and click and but we will print all of the resources that we need. So that will save a lot of prep time for the teachers. And it's very, it looks very similar for math. If we go to the next slide. Oh, yes. So they have the um, resource slides that they'll teach from. They also have the interactive tutorial slides. They have the student resources. And then we have additional supplemental resources that will make up their, their learning centers and any type of interventions that they need to do throughout the course of the. I would like to say that this is very similar to what we built in our K3 pacing guides. So our teachers are familiar with this format. It is all hyperlinked for them, their scope and sequence, their pacing guide. Everything is already set for them as far as their lesson plans. Everything is done. So the teachers, that part of the planning process is done for them. Uh, the interventions that the students will need, the individual interventions, are going to be in the supplemental resources. So if a teacher, if a student needs something special, it is also already in the iReady resources. As the student goes back and needs a specific resource, they'll be able to go back and find that resource that student needs, dependent upon whatever level that student is on or whatever intervention that student needs. And lastly, before questions, all of these supplemental resource documents were attached to your board packet. This is what we use to kind of guide our revisions of the scope and sequence. And we also have that uh, program, the learning recovery and enrichment programs. We have our lovely ladies over here who have helped us to make sure we're reaching all of our students this summer in any capacity that may arrive. Now, Dr. Emanuel. I have questions. Question. Dr. Emanuel. I want to go back to the data and I want to thank you all so very much for bringing that to us. Now, now we know where we are, what we have to do, and how we're doing what we're doing. And I appreciate that. I do have a question that's very concerning. I know it's concerning to you guys and all of us. The 739 children who you said, and clarified if I misunderstood, that did not participate, 
What does that mean? They didn't sign on, period. Are they still in our school system? That's 739 children. To your knowledge, did any of them come back when we started face to face? I mean, you may not know that data. I'm just asking. It is our understanding that the students did not participate virtually this year. However, they are still in our school system. Home visits were made. There were attempts to locate those students. Those students were still enrolled. They participated some, but they just did not log on. Uh, Dr. Carb, you might be able to elaborate a little bit more. Talked about if they didn't perform the work, like if there was work packets, they did not complete those. They didn't attend class. So even after home visits, they did not show up for class, and they did not complete any work. So they may have shown up one or two days here or there, but as a whole, they did not actually participate in instruction. And um, I support services that those are referrals for our court system. Right. I mean, every opportunity was given. But to have 739 children, which I'm not saying it's the children's fault, because I would assume they were under 16 years of age, uh, it, 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 it's an issue that we've got 739 lost students, lost instruction, lost for a year. That's sad. Thank you for doing the data. I'm so appreciative that we all want to thank y'all. Arthur, Mr. Tanner. I know, uh, slide 16, I know we massaged this. Uh, I just want to ask for clarification between the last two burger dots. A date for assessments will be established. What does that mean? Okay, basically that means like the read to achieve assessment. Okay, on that date, typically we hold that, the read to achieve assessment, the day before students exit the program so that we can have the last day for makeup testing. So. But that's typically, we have not set that date as of yet. Um, typically, our ready assessments will be given on the last week of the program, but we have not set the exact dates yet. And that's what we mean by a date for assessments will be given. And also the state has not determined yet as to whether or not the iReady EOY, Bobby, please correct me if I'm wrong, the EOY may be used for the beginning of the program. There is a possibility that we do not have to test at the beginning of the program, and we may be able to use the EOY. There is a chance. So there are some things that are still in flux, and that's the reason that statement is. Thank you. Is that correct, Bobby? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Evans, if you could, uh, and I know we'll get some in personnel, but just reiterate uh, or it had been discussed about the teachers or people employed this summer was being asked to work all summer long in the entire program. And you, can you just reiterate that that is the case with the people we have coming on board, that they will be working the entire summer program to six weeks? It is my understanding that they are supposed to work for the entire six weeks. Um, Ms. Thompson? <coughs> That is the expectation that um, our employees who applied, we ask that all, only those who could um, dedicate the six weeks to apply, and that has been our direction to an um, employee or at least recommend to the board those people who said that they could work the entire six weeks. Of course, we know that things happen, just um, you know, people get sick or whatever, so we will have to handle those situations as they come. But it is our expectation to only employ those that we know can be here or who have told us they can be here for the duration of the six weeks. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Yes, Mr. Chairman, let me ask Bobby, let's talk about the 739 students, uh, the business rules that apply in power school and why that's necessary so that we won't have a negative impact on the students and then the incomplete. Talk about that because we are concerned about uh, that number and those students. Uh, Chairman Lowry, Dr. Williamson, board members, that number, when we collected that information for the principals, we just asked them very, very quickly to give us the number of how many students that, have, that they are aware of that have missed 10 consecutive days. As we get to the end of the school year, especially at the high school level, 
a large majority of those kids have decided to come back and take a test. So what it's going to end up doing is begin to reduce that 739 because I may have missed 10 days prior to today, but since I show up today, I'm no longer considered missing. So what we're going to end up doing is working with our principals to see in the last 10 days how many kids do we actually have that you have not been able to contact or have not physically been in our buildings. And we expect that number to uh, drop dramatically. Uh, it's also some of the principals are using that as a means to drive those kids coming to summer school. Sure, you haven't been here the last 10 days. You have an F in the course, but we're going to offer summer school for you to come and, and able to recruit that particular credit. One particular principal I spoke with this morning, he listed triple digits for he has a high number of students that were out. But a lot of those kids are starting to feel, uh, filter back in to take tests. So we're not missing that many. But come Friday, I would say that number will probably be a third, if not even a greater decrease than that that you're currently seeing now. And if they have 10 consecutive days, uh, the business rule said we need to drop them. And that's to their benefit because it won't have a negative impact on the GPA. That's correct. And we're still, even if we drop them, we are going to work with power school. Let's say a kid has missed the last 10 days uh, and we end up dropping them. We're going to work away in power school to still allow those kids to get in here for credit recovery and recover those additional credit or recover the credit that they lost this school year for whatever reason that may be. Great. Uh, if somebody could address that uh, slide or numbers about how many seniors are not currently on track to graduate June the 4th, when I look at those numbers, uh, like Fairmont 23, Lumberton, does anybody have the number of students that are supposed to graduate at Fairmont and Lumberton and Pernell Sweat? Does anybody have those numbers? I don't. I'm I ain't got to be to the penny, but like it, say Fairmont, there's 115 or whatever. I can throw, I can guesstimate, guys, and I think Fairmont High may be around 150 to 180. 50 to 180. Lumberton's going to be right at 400. Red Springs is going to be about 150. St. Paul should be about two. If I'm not mistaken, Pernell Sweat's going to be between 350 and four. And referring back to those numbers of the two, 235, 240, I'm not sure exactly what those numbers are. Again, those are Floyd numbers because a kid may have not done anything. Let's use English 4, for instance. A kid may not have done English four, anything in English 4 and they have a failing grade, but the teacher has worked with the child. And come Friday, they will have turned in their missed assignments and they're going to be able to take that 50 and turn it into a passing grade. So, again, that's a very fluid number it's kind of hard to say we have exactly this number of kids because every day as kids turn in more work and as we administer i, I understand i understand that i knew that i knew it's a fluid number but i i just think about where we was at so i could have a understand who how hard everybody is. probably if in the morning or even this afternoon if you look in power school at the number of our senior class because that's what you're really asking. Yeah. I've seen your class number. Yeah, and so Dr. Locklear already has that. So Fremont High is 163. Lumberton is 397. Red Springs High is 184. Pernell Sweat is 352. And St. Paul's High is 181. All right, Mr. Bobby. Sure. I don't know if I would have been surprised at the fair getting closest to the numbers or not. We're close. He was close. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> and Dr. Wayne, same as you. Yesterday when we met at that curriculum committee meeting, is that was it part of that House bill, or Senate bill, one of them bills you said that people were out working, <clears throat> they had to log and dictate that they called John Jones' house. And so and so. That's correct. <clears throat> we have a running number. <laughs> We have a composite number, and what slide was that composite? I think it was one, oh, it was one of those slides there toward the end, where we had the line graph. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mr. Chairman, what was that question? Documentation. Number ten. By the track you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Got my heart. Yeah. Real share. Can you share that again, please? Um, the methods that we used to contact these students who were in danger of retention, it was letters, uh, 30, uh, 89.2%, phone calls, that was 100% of our student teachers at our school, home visits, Right at 100%, 95% of our school. Real chair, that's our calling system. Canvas, certified mail, nine social workers and guidance counselors. Class Dojo, which is another system similar to Renan. Um, somebody else said Renan and Class Dojo together. Our YDSs and social workers. So some people put those together, so that was, it kind of split that. <coughs> Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Renond app, text with parents, emails, emails, social worker documentation, Renond, Messenger, Google Meets, Dojo, Google Meets with parents, parent conference, and Google Meets. So all these were different methods. And a lot of these, like where you see your social workers on there and those sorts of things, and YDSs, they are not in one place because they were split up. What some of our principals did was put it all on one line. So it kind of split it up on the graph. Those would be higher percentages if they weren't split up over several different, um, like they combined them in like YDS social worker visits, dojo, and then we see social worker documentation and those different things. If we combine social worker visits with YDS, it would be a higher percentage. So. I'm pretty sure all of our principals, all of our school users, social workers, are wide again. So y'all, I mean, those, those are some home visits made in some of those. So you have a... Oh, home visits for 95% of our schools. Okay. But you record, y'all have everything wrote down that transpired. Megan, is that correct? We have the documentation, the log, those visits, so we have that, correct. the Mallow record. Social workers have logs of what they've been doing. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. A question for clarification. Is there anything else, Mr. Chair, that we've got to approve with this part here? Has everything been approved? Uh, I think we're good except for whatever we've got to approve tonight is what down here. What's I was down talking here. about the summer school stuff. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been approved. It's been approved. Uh, it's good. Yeah, so we, 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 we don't have to do anything else for that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mr. Chairman and members, I want to share with you uh, all that we know at this point about our plan to return to school in August. Uh, it is our intent to return five days a week in person learning and teaching. Uh, that we're prepared to do that, and CDC is supporting that effort. So that is our intent to return. Five days a week, in person teaching and learning. We'll follow all the guidelines by uh, public health protocols, uh, strong school, public schools, strong schools, NC public health, toolkit, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and our CDC guidance. Let me ask Ms. Charlene Lockley if you come and share what we need about nutrition at this point. Dr. Chairman Lowry, Dr. Williamson, and board members. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Child Nutrition Program. For us returning back to school, uh, we would like for the students to return to the cafeteria for meal pickup and still under the classroom consumption. Um, this way, this would allow our all of our sales to get restarted for um, child nutrition. The strong schools. <coughs> A lot of toolkit guidance for us is that we discontinue to use any self-service food or beverage distribution in the cafeteria. 
Um, all of our meals should be individually packaged and handed to the students, um, including milk or juice and snacks. Um, the cleaning and hygiene, the CDC recommendation is the routine cleaning and disinfection only after someone is sick or diagnosed with the COVID. So, but for child nutrition, um, our staff will continue to fight the God, follow the guidelines for our HACCP procedure <coughs> for cleaning um, the cafeteria and other items. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what do we know about halfway? Good evening. Good evening. So for the 2021-22 uh, 20, school year, at this time, the NCHSA, uh, they're planning on starting fall sports as normal. Um, they already have a calendar in place for next school year, and you should have that in your packet. Um, first official day of fall practice will begin on August the 2nd. Uh, teams will be allowed to have summer workouts and summer camps. Uh, we'll continue to follow the NCHSA protocols throughout the summer and fall. Uh, middle schools, we're also looking at starting as normal in the fall with uh, football and volleyball. The first day of practice for the middle schools with football and volleyball will be August the 30th, uh, with the first game slated for September the 16th. Um, Keep in mind there are two dead periods in the summer, uh, the week of July 5th and the week of July 19th. There should be no athletic activity at this time. Um, and we also encourage all of our coaches and our athletes to get vaccinated. The state encourages that also. Uh, due to if, if you're vaccinated and you get exposed to COVID, uh, then you, you don't have to quarantine. You can continue to participate. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, finally, it is our intent to um, return to prime time um, before and after school care. So again, it is our hope that we can return five days a week to in-person teaching and learning. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the uh, Esther 2 and Esther 3, Miss Erica and Miss Jennifer. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, and board members. Good evening. Um, this slide should look familiar to everyone. Um, this is the summary that we gave at a previous meeting that shows the acts that have been passed um, at the federal level and the types of funding that our district has received um, with all of the expiration dates. The only thing that's changed in this document is our actual ESSER 2 allotment was slightly lower and I've updated that document. But this again just reiterates the um, funding sources that we've received along with all the expiration dates we are using. ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 to fund the summer learning that we just learned about. And once we get more final numbers on the personnel, we'll have a budget that we can send out to everybody. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Williamson, and board members. This evening, I'll provide an overview of the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funding. But before I go any further along, I'd like to share some great news. We have been approved for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. Okay. <laughs> without the work of everyone and the team that participated, so it was just a collaborative, wonderful effort with lots of conversation and much needed work to move our district forward. Awesome. The district developed a team of approximately 25 members. The team consisted of principals, recruiters, team chairs, and district departments. The purpose of the team was to respond to the COVID pandemic funding in three ways. That would be in prevention of, reduction of, and response to. Those were our guiding responses that led the conversation, along with the district team also reviewed various data points. And those data sources did include our READY diagnostic tool, reading and math, K-8, 
High School EOC, Gaggle, which many of you are familiar with that we approved back in the early fall, which is a proactive and preventive approach to identifying mental health needs, attendance, which we had a lengthy conversation on just a few minutes ago as well, and the building facility report that is completed annually, I believe it may not be annually, but I believe it's every five years. And then Dr. Williamson, along with other district members as well as the board, we did do a district facility report and that added to the data as well. As the district team reviewed the data sources, what they discovered was there were two glaring focus areas that came out of the data sources. And those two areas that we identified were student learning needs and health and safety. With those student learning needs, with student learning, what we came up with is what is it exactly is the data telling us that we need to do with student learning? So after reviewing the data, these are the needs that we specifically identified. And that would be a need for certified teachers in hard to staff areas. Elementary, math, EC. Targeted support for students and staff on tier one, tier two, and tier three. Better known as our MTSS or multi-tiered system of support. Professional development to school personnel on providing tiered mental health, which you'll hear a little bit more about that later on with the mental health plan, and social and emotional learning resources, professional development, and curriculum. After reviewing the building facility report and additional facility report information, what we noticed in health and safety is, of course, there are facility improvements that need to occur for upgrading. There's been much conversation, I believe, throughout the pandemic about ventilation, also about air conditioning systems and sanitation. After the team reviewed the focus areas, there was much conversation. What is it exactly can we do to address those needs and what activities will make this happen for the public schools of Robinson County? So after much conversation, these are the student learning needs. These became our activities. District tech staff, interventionist K2, if you recall, each time basically I stand before you as a board, I often talk about K2 being the foundation, early literacy. When you look at the data across the state, I was just reading something today, and 75% of our students in grade three that have taken the BOG have not passed. That's staggering when you think about it. So we expect we're gonna have similar numbers as well, so we will have the K2 interventionist, of course, Nurse, nurse extenders. That will just spread the scope of the work that our nurses currently do. Academic coaches, we're proposing that each K-8 school will have an academic coach. Social workers, again, to increase the need of social workers. I think we're seeing more and more the need for that as well. Assistant principals, teacher assistants. Summer learning, we've just spoken of. <coughs> teacher assistant PD on the science of reading. Software, iPads, computers, interactive boards, dot ins, social and emotional learning curriculum, progress monitoring tool. That is the tool that we will utilize to help us assess how our students are doing in those early grades, which goes back to align with the tier one, two, and three support for MTSS. Health and safety, touchless restrooms and water fountains, air purifiers, all facilities, every room, every site. All buses, buses, additional buses, buses for social distancing, playgrounds. I think we all know we've seen our playgrounds. They're in need of repair, but also in social distancing. HVAC, renovations, outdoor classrooms, and windows. Are there any questions about how we developed the plan for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3? Any questions? Terry? Are we going to be using any, any, of, any of these funds to, um, to establish any partnerships or strengthen existing partnerships for, uh, for beginning teachers in terms of uh, mentorships, uh, mentor opportunities, and, and uh, those sorts of activities? Yes, we will. Um, not necessarily, when we look at mentoring, we're thinking of the academic coaches. We have talked about the academic coaches. Those academic coaches will be able to develop those one-to-one -one relationships 
and to move those teachers forward. We recognize in a hard to staff district that beginning te teachers are key to turnaround for us, as well as to support them to maintain and recruit. So those academic coaches will be a portion of what we do to support them, of course, with other feedback that we'll be giving to the principals, assistant principals, and the normal course of action that we take. And when UNC is on their beginning teacher program, we are, but it's been, it hasn't been as active, but they do send a newsletter each month to the beginning teachers, so we do still have that partnership. It's not as active as it was prior to the pandemic when we had monthly meetings, but yes, sir. We also have Title II funding that is a support for those beginning teachers, so like these funds we have to go back to those three areas of and have that COVID relationship involved with spending ESSER two and ESSER three as well. And we are reviewing, we've just had a recent team meeting with Title II. We're in the process of planning for federal programs again this year, of course, all the titles. And with that being said, we have looked at those areas of because we are a hard to staff district. So Title II is really looking toward building that capacity and making that happen for the teachers within the district, not just our beginning teachers, but sustaining all of our teachers and especially those part of staff areas as well. Also look at expanding. We currently have a program TAs to teachers with the state. We're looking, um, proposing for next year to expand that program. And um, what that does is it gives TAs who are interested in becoming teachers, it gives them so much money each year that we repay for their classes for them to finish to get their teaching certification. And that has and that has been approved. Uh, initially, when we were looking and having that conversation early on, uh, not necessarily does Title II always fund TAs in that role, but after much conversation talking about our data and our needs at our district level and the learning loss, the federal uh, state department has allowed us to do that. So I think that's kudos for this team as well at the district level because that is not typically normal practice. Mr. Gentry. I want to make sure I understand. So, ESSER two and three have have just been approved, and what I what we've seen here is a, a list of needs, and some of them uh, more uh, severe than others. So, it, the next phase will be uh, allocating funds and prioritizing particular oh, line okay. items. Yes. So oh, could you go back to the activities for us? Those needs generated, uh, Mr. Gentry, those needs generated for us the activities that we have here. So as a direct result of the data we created the needs, the needs led to these activities. So yes, they will be budgeted. That is how and what we propose to do for ESSER 2 and 3. Mr. Chairman, comment. Yeah, Dr. Williamson, Ms. Brandon, then you. Okay. Erica, will you share with us Summer school was an unfunded mandate. Was. And so what are we using and can you give us a price tag? It's a wonderful opportunity for our parents if we can get kids to come to close that learning slot. Can you share where and how much? Yes, sir. So if we look at the summer school budget in total, and I based it on projections, so that's why I said we would we have actual numbers based on who gets approved tonight, I'll fill that in. But so far, between all the positions, we're at uh, $10.2 million in the cost to fund this summer program. That is hiring site coordinators, teachers, nurses, social workers, guidance counselors, media, TAs, bus drivers, cafeteria managers, and assistants, along with a handful of interpreters. And that does not include retirement because all of the, as we mentioned before, all of the employees over the summer will be on a temporary contract and those wages will not be subject to retirement or that would have inflated the numbers even more. We have currently budgeted 10.9 in case those projections need to be adjusted. And 4.5 of that is in ESSER 2, I'm sorry, ESSER 1, CARES Act. If we could go back to that first slide. Oh, thank you. So four and a half million are coming out of the ESSER 1 and the remainder of that we've put in at ESSER 2. So they'll be split between both of those and we can adjust that um, depending on how everything actually comes out. But that is currently how it's budgeted in the breakdown. And once we pay for the summer program, all of our ESSER 1 funds will have been depleted. And we'll spend them in that order because 
of the expiration dates of those funding sources. As to one, I'm sorry. And I just want to bring out, too, since we're talking about summer learning in the semester three, you'll notice we had to put 20% of semester three activities toward learning loss as well. So it doesn't just go away when we do the summer school. It is a continuation of the work that we're doing, meeting those needs of those students with closing those learning gaps. Ms. Brenda? Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that it's good to see them bringing that back for the TAs because the last time that we had it years ago, Dr. Zoe Locklear was assistant superintendent with our school system. So that's good to know that they're bringing that back. And were there valuable team players, their instructional leaders as well in our business? That's right. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, graduation procedures and guidelines. Mr. Lawson. Uh, Ms. Mr. Lowry, Superintendent, Dr. Williamson, and board members, this has came up any, many times before tonight. And as a board, we had always said that there wouldn't be any other cords or anything like that presented at graduation other than um, what, the, what the schools give out as far as academic accomplishments. I've had several phone calls. I know other board members have had several phone calls. I have spoken with Dr. Williamson about this, but I feel like that it's the board's decision because it is the procedure and guidelines. And if we are gonna do it, it needs to be open for everybody, not just one group of people. So, in, in saying that, I want to hear what other board members think and where we should go with this. The part that I want to read, though, in the procedure and guidelines, <clears throat> as it says in cords on the second page, cords, stoles, and medallions. Um, honor graduates can wear cords that have been provided by the schools only. And when it says that, there's no outside, there's no inside, that is per school for academics. I know that there is, um, there's a list of um, cords and what their representation is when a student graduates. My thing is though, the bottom line, is that if there's other cords that are being presented um, to students, are they allowed to wear them? Because in our um, procedure guidelines for graduation, it says by the schools only. So if we're gonna change this, it needs to be a board decision, not a person picking out and choosing. And if we, if we do this, then you're opening it up to all sorts of things. And I know that Mike's been on this board one of the longest and Miss Brenda, and when I came on here, we, we had these things to come up and it was stated that it would be schools only. So I want, I want to know the, um, the way the board feels about it. Because like I said, I've had phone calls, we need to address it. Um, there's no graduations that have taken place as of yet, and that if we do it, we need to be on board or we need to be off board. We need to stick to it or not stick to it. Okay? Dr. Williams? Thank you. Let me address that, Ms. Fossum. You and I had a, a good, great conversation, I thought. Um, I own the decision uh, to for the courts. Um, you're absolutely correct in what we have with procedures and guidelines. Um, we do not have a policy that directly address uh, graduation cords that I shared with you and some other board members. It is our intent that we will draft a policy that clearly defines um, what can and cannot be. We have that ready for you in the fall. Um, I shared with you that there is a policy. It's policy 3440. The title of it is recognized and excellent that I believe in you talk with our attorney that gives the superintendent the authority to make that type of decision 
because we don't have a policy in place at this point. Um, and we can recognize and honor kids. And Mr. Craig, I, I respect that, but policy and procedures come from the board. Procedures too. The thing about it is, is that if you set precedents, Mr. Grady, if you set precedents, that's what you that's what you intend to do in the future. I think you've told us that many times that if you set precedents and what we've done in the past, we haven't allowed anything from outside to be worn at graduation. I mean, we've had we've had um, people to come to us with uh, painting caps, with uh, with feathers, with all kinds of things. And we said that we were going to stick to what our procedure said. So in that procedure, it says that the cores that have been provided by the school only. And I'm just saying, if you're going to open it up, that's fine. But if you're not going to open it up and you're going to let one group of people do it and the others not, that's not being fair. And I'm first and foremost on this board to be fair to everyone. And from what I have heard, that this isn't a fair judgment. And I want to see what other board members have to say about it. Mr. Chair. I got Mr. Gentry was first, and then Mr. Ponte, and then Dr. Manning. Mr. Gentry. I think, I think it's important to recognize that this is not strictly an, an ethnic matter. It is a school board of education, Robinson County, public schools, Robinson County sanctioned organization that is legitimate, that happens to be participated in largely by Native American students. Uh, my understanding is that the door is open for others out of other ethnic groups to also participate in YDS and the other organizations and activities that primarily Native American students participate in, but again, uh, it's open to others. It, 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 it's not a situation, in my view, where uh, a particular group has just gone off the deep end and, and said and demanded to be recognized. It is a school organized, public schools of Roberts County organized activity by legitimized organizations and recognizing those students who have participated in that, just as we would recognize students who have participated in any other organization. It's not, there are other ways that students are recognized other than academics at graduation. And this is one of them. So, uh, I am in favor of retaining what the, what the tradition has been until there's further study and as superintendent said, if, there, if it's indicative that we need to have an updated or change in policy, then we'll reckon with that. But as it stands right now, I, I don't see anything standing in the way of proceeding with what's been allowed in the past regarding the graduation of Native American students. Dr. Mann. Uh, and I agree with uh, Mr. Gentry's assessment. I don't know. I guess my question is, has any other ethnic group been denied to present a court? Yes. I don't see. I don't know if they've been. Now, I know about the hats. I know all about that. I'm not talking about a hat. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a court. I don't know. Somebody can enlighten me if anybody's been denied the opportunity to present a court. They have not, and I have not received a request for that. And presently, we have some um, students who are going to wear some sasses and things of that nature, so that's not part of the list. But it is part of the policy to honor and recognize seniors for their time in the public schools of Roberts County and their accomplishment. But we have not had a single request. We might have to tonight, but at this point, we have not. Thank you. And also, as he said, IEA is one of the functions and the supporters, the culture center, 
of one of our programs and I I think it's if it's going to change you can't change it after the fact because they've already been awarded these scores in my opinion but now be the fact that no one's been denied no other ethnic group's been denied the opportunity to present a court see I didn't even know they were presenting courts because I, I wasn't invited so no board member that I know of on this board said what to do we're, we're sanctioning this we're going to do this it was just an organization that supports our native children did this Bonte? um I have I have no problem with um, <clears throat> with uh, people in their culture being recognized I have no problem with that but we are a very diverse county so if one group can be recognized for their culture and their past history I think everybody should be recognized I don't I don't care if you uh, African American Asian white you everybody recognized we're very diverse and the, I heard you say there's no other e ethnic group that has um, that has requested that it's it's too late now i'm saying it's too late for it because stuff that's been going on in the past has always been denied so no other group has came forward because they didn't know you could now i think it's also too late for somebody else or another group to come say we want to do it because they can't I'm pretty sure they can't order no tassels or what else now so i can i comment mr Bonte? i don't know of my instance have anybody ever been denied any ethnic group or the opportunity to present a court? Now, Miss Furby's been here a long time. I don't. Not a court now. I'm talking about a court, not a hat. I want to yeah. put them in a hat. I guess. Dr. Williams. I do want to address, Mr. Leach. Uh, that is our intent, but the policy uh, is to tie it all to academic and really to tie the cultural part to our social studies standards that would lend itself for that to use it, tied to a GPA as a motivator, would provide that opportunity to recognize all cultures. That is our intent and our policy, that we will write. Yeah, I gotta follow up. I, I do understand that, and that is great. You know, that's a great idea. But we're talking about, we got graduations tomorrow, and we got graduations in the following weeks. So what are we gonna do? That, that There's all kinds of stuff going out there, the elephant in the room, we just need to come and discuss it. Mr. Smith. Um, my, my question is, and something that I've been getting a lot of political answers on that I just can't seem to get a grasp on that maybe somebody can help me out here tonight. The cords. What are the cords supposed to be for? I need an answer. I need I need the truth. On this right here, what what are the cords for? Anybody, Mr. Chairman, may I? Brenda, in uh, 2004, we addressed this same issue we're dealing with right now, and there was other ethnic groups that also wanted to wear the core, but our board denied it. And, it, and the reason I know it's so bad, so so good, because my husband died during this discussion time. And we did not, and that's how, when Randy said, wait, uh, it's about this, this is when this came forth, that we would not allow it, except it was open up. But we, we said we would not allow outside organizations and just stick to the public schools of Robson County for cores. That's what Randy was making uh, reference to. Uh, I, I, I want to go along, I agree with Vontae. I think it's too late for us because there are groups that has already came and they because of what we they knew we operated in the past they did not do it and they did it they did do it on their site however they know that they cannot wear it at graduation so it's what's been operating in the past and that's why <coughs> like Monte said Ms. Leach said that's why they feel that way so my question is I'm still trying to figure out what are courts for what's the purpose of the academic academics excellent for what academic achievements i can hear you mr henry academic achievements that's what they were presented for and i i'm Not like dr emmanuel i wasn't part of that invitation i found out after the fact but it was to recognize uh seniors that's graduating that were higher with honors with honors and that's and that's what i'm trying to that's what i'm trying to get a grasp on right here is and, are they for academic achievements and et cetera? 
or is it or is it what these kids have worked for? It's what they worked for yeah. all their life to get here. So, so that's what I'm getting to. I'm, it's an association. It's a situation to where if we're going to stick with academics, we need to stick with academics. If we're not going to stick with academics, I'm telling you guys, we're opening up Pandora's box, whether you believe it or not. And you guys better think hard and heavy because I'm going to tell you, when everybody starts coming with their own cord, there'll be nothing you can do because we opened it up for everybody. This is not the one, nobody, under, I'm not about that. But I'm like, if we're going to use it for just like what we just said, academic achievements, it needs to stick to academic achievements, period. And I hope I'm not sounding hard, but I don't think this is, we shouldn't have to think outside the box <clears throat> on this situation right here. So I want everybody to be fair. I, I mean, it's, you want all the kids to be taken care of in the way they need to be taken care of. You want them to be able to receive what they're supposed to be able to receive at times. But what bothers me more than anything is this, I'm just gonna tell you guys, this was like, this was un hush hush. Dr. Emanuel, you said you didn't hear anything about it, did you? I didn't know, no, no sir, I didn't. Or didn't know anything about it? I, I didn't know anything. None of us really didn't hear nothing about it. Then all of a sudden it comes crawling from up underneath the table. Now I got a problem with that when you're cramming it down my throat. And be supposed to be representing the public schools of Robson County, then when you start having other groups come to you, then we're opening it up, guys. I don't like that. We're all here to be able to be made aware of everything and be able to discuss things and be able to make decisions that we need to be made for the well-being of the public schools. But not like this, when I feel like it's been under the table. I don't like that. I think we need to be, everything needs to be up front and laid out on the table for everybody so that way it can be discussed with it. That's the only thing that bothers me about this right here. Dr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Chairman and members, when we had the discussion, the high school principals, was in the room and we all understood uh, how we would proceed. But we can end the conversation. I can retract that and and wait and see if we can draft a policy. I do not have a problem. Uh, as I said, um, Mr. Lawson, I own the decision. Um, done and under the policy uh, that's in place, but we can retract that and not have to have a long debate over it. That's not an issue, not for me. Mr. Tanner. Mr. Chair, I was going to say, I think the key is like Dr. Williamson said, we can put a policy in place. And I heard what Vontae had to say, too, about the urgency of the matter. But, uh, Mr. DeWayne, um, there's over $10 million that's funneled through Indian education process, whether it be state, whether it be federal. And we have to handshake with them because that money has to be handed off to the school system. So in response to your question, that organization says, we're gonna present a court to represent the great academics of these students. So I understand your concern. It, it is in the line of academics, but if we don't have a policy procedure in place, it can get out of hand. We could have any kind of courts to show that's up. And that's, that's my and, whole concern right there. That, that's and I am for, I am for, if you open it for one, you open it for all. Right. But you've got to have guidelines. It's a, if it's associated with academics, I have a problem with it. Now, personally, I don't. I don't care who brings it to the table. Can I, can I say what I want to share? And Mr. Terry was next. I'll just answer his question. <laughs> I do. I do like the idea of the uh, of the cords being um, associated with, uh, with with academic achievement, um, and I also think it makes a difference. You know, in my mind, I, I'm not aware of the historical perspective. You know, I you know I, as a new board member, I don't have that uh, that insight from the past. But I also think that it may be a little bit different. You know, in this situation, because because of our relationship this board's relationship with uh, with iea and we also partner with the tribe on on numerous um uh, 
numerous initiatives as well. Um, so I, I do like the idea of, of those cords providing that incentive to help um, close that achievement gap. So, um, but I, I, I'm interested in having a, a formal policy as well. I do think that we need to have something in writing on who, who we partner with or who we allow and how, how we allow these cords to be displayed and used. Mr. Chair. I got two or three. Uh, Mr. Gentry was first. I, I need a point of clarification here. It, are, are we setting a precedent here tonight or has this been uh, done in the past? My understanding is that, there, that the cords or, or some like facsimile has been awarded in the past. Or is this a, this will be a first? It will be a first. If it, I'm, I'm not, to my knowledge, has the court, the court hasn't been awarded. To my knowledge, that hasn't been. Now, since I've been on the board, this has not come up. This is my fifth year. This issue has not come in front of the board since I've been on it. The courts have never been awarded. Okay? <laughs> There's been questions or isolated things that's come up from different years, and usually what came up was the hat. And that, that's usually if something come up about adding something else, it was something on the hat. And I think, and I'm only guessing now, somebody has to help me, that that over the years has been denied. Or there's been some other compromise work. But as far as a cord or something on the neck, to my knowledge, it's never happened. Mr. Chairman, and I would like to add one other thing. Uh, to my knowledge, you know, and I, I don't want the, we, we were talking about people not knowing about this or what have you. Uh, to my knowledge, I didn't, and I don't think any board member received invitations to ceremonies last week. Uh, I know I didn't receive one, not from the Lumbee tribe, which is where this was given out. Now, why, why not? I do not know. Uh, you know, some things that's happened at 2020 hindsight, this could have been taken care of, in my opinion, a whole lot easier. But, you know, we're here now, so tonight we've got to make a decision and do what we have to. So I'll stop there, and I had Dr. Emanuel, and I had Ms. Brenda. Dr. Emanuel? But in lieu of a written policy, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Law, and anybody smart, it doesn't the superintendent have to take a stand? Well, I'm wrong. I mean, the superintendent spoke to that earlier. I think 3440 gives him that authority yes. yeah, to, to make that decision uh, because it, it, it clearly talks about not only school recognition, but community recognition. And I think that's where this would fall. But I think the superintendent's made it clear that he's uh, ready to retract that and go on and look at a policy for next year. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Forward. That's right, Mr. Chairman. And that's my recommendation. We don't need to bring it to a vote. Um, I'll retract that. I'll talk with the high school principals. And again, be clear, we'll try to draft a policy and move forward. Um, but um, again, I'll own the decision. Don't have a problem with that. And we can move on. Okay. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. Go to action items. Uh, PSRC 2122 Virtual Instruction Plan, Dr. Robert. And I'm going to yield to Dr. Cummings and Mr. Sinclair. Good afternoon, Chairman Lowry, Dr. Williamson, and board. Mr. Sinclair and I will be giving an overview of our virtual instruction plan. What is our virtual instruction option? The public schools of Robinson County is providing a virtual instruction option to students in grades four through 12 and parents under specific criteria and expectations. These criteria and expectations are being set to ensure the success of all virtual students. Schools will be allowed to enroll up to 10% of their eligible population into the virtual instruction. Students in pre-K-3 are not eligible for virtual instruction. Students must have maintained an 80 
or above in grades three through 12 in all subject areas during the 2021 school year. Students must be in compliance with the attendance policy outlined in the Public Schools of Robinson County Policy Manual. Students must have a reliable internet connection, five megabytes up, up. The district will not provide internet access. Students in grades four through five must have an adult 18 or older at home during the virtual instruction. With our student expectations this year, virtual instruction will look totally different from remote instruction for the 2020-21 school year. Students will follow the exact schedule for their assigned school while participating in virtual instruction. Students will attend and participate in daily Google Meets with the teacher for synchronous instruction. Students will adhere to the general dress code policy. They should have a designated quiet space at home with no interruptions. During the Google Meet, cameras for all students should remain on and students should remain visible for the entire class period. Students are expected to remain on the Google Meet for the duration of the meet or until the teacher dismisses them. Students are expected to actively participate, answer questions, participate in discussions, etc., in all classroom activities. Grade requirements. Students must maintain an 80% average in all graded areas to continue to remain virtual. If a student is not able to maintain a grade of 80% or higher in all sections for each quarter, which is nine weeks, then the student will return to in-person instruction. The teacher will make contact with the parents concerning at-risk students in the event that they drop. Testing expectations. For all district benchmarks and state assessments, students are required to take tests in person at a school location. Even if students are enrolled in virtual instruction, they still have to take all mandated tests at the school. Student attendance expectations. Students are expected to attend virtually on a daily basis and will be held accountable for their attendance. Failure to attend school consistently in the virtual environment may result in the student being ineligible for the continuation of the program. If a technical issue prevents a student from participating in a synchronous activity, they are still counted absent. Unless otherwise stated, virtual attendance policies will follow PSRC Board Policy 4400. Student Discipline Guidelines. Students are expected to conduct themselves appropriately while under school supervision and to comply with the policies that govern student conduct. Parents and students must be aware that conduct is unacceptable and disruptive in the regular classroom environment is typically equally unacceptable in the virtual classroom. Inappropriate conduct in the virtual classroom may result in disciplinary action in accordance with the public schools of Robinson County Student Code of Conduct. Eligibility for athletics and extracurricular. Virtual instruction students will be able to participate in extra and co-curricular activities such as athletics, arts, and clubs at their assigned school. However, transportation will not be provided to those activities. <laughs> Teacher expectations. Due to the limitation of 10% of the student population being enrolled in virtual instruction and limited teacher allotments, all teachers will be expected to teach hybrid classes. Teacher's instructional day may consist of in-person and hybrid classes. Scheduling of students is at the principal's discretion. As a general practice, students will be enrolled in the school where their teacher record is based. Teachers will work from a physical PSRC campus. Teachers will utilize phone calls, email, Canvas learning management system, class dojo or remind as a means of communication with students and parents. Teachers will use effective virtual instruction learning strategies 
to engage students in inquiry-based learning that is differentiated for all learners. Teachers will maintain an active Canvas LMS course synced from PowerSchool to house all student work assignments, lesson videos, and general information for the class. Now, our application process. The virtual instruction application will be posted on the di district website. Parents can print the application out or pick one at, up at the school, but a signed application must be submitted. The application must be submitted to the student's home school by June 9, 2021. The principal will complete the school information form for each student request and submit the Google form for all eligible students to the district office no later than June 24, 2021. The Virtual Instruction Review Committee will review the request and the final decision will be made by the district office. If a student request is approved, the principal will notify the students and will schedule accordingly. If approved, the request will be for the 2021-22 school year and student progress will be reviewed periodically. Are there any comments or questions regarding the virtual instruction plan for the 2021-22 school year? Dr. Manny? I think, so there won't be confusion. Uh, will you tell them when this is, this is beginning the school year? This is not this summer. Because we had some confusion with the committee with it. Yes. The virtual plan is for when, starting when? So the summer learning and, enrich and enrichment recovery plan is all face-to-face -face and will be offered this summer. It's this the summer. The virtual this instruction virtual plan, plan is when? The virtual instruction plan will begin with the fall semester in August. And what is what the two biggest differences in last year and this year with the virtual? So one of the major differences between this past year's remote instruction and next year's virtual instruction plan is that students will be required to follow the exact same schedule as their school. So last year we had limitations on the time period that students were logged online and they were able to log on and cut their cameras off. This year, for students participating in virtual instruction, they have to stay on for the entire day, follow that school schedule, and remain visible at all times. Okay? The second part of that is we are going to hold you accountable for your grades that you are obtaining. If you cannot meet the 80% threshold, then you will be returned back to in-person instruction. Thank you. Ms. Dantry. We're seeing more and more of our culture, our society. Uh, up. Uh, we're all still wearing masks here, but there are places now that you go and not wear the mask. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of activities that are allowed now uh, that weren't allowed two months ago. And hopefully, I, I think we all agree that that's going to progress to the point uh, where, and I know a lot of work has gone into this, but that all of this goes away, hopefully. You know, that's, that's the goal. And so if, in fact, that does happen, and it could, uh, between now and the time this is to be implemented, so what happens then? We, we, are we ready to go back to a total in-person learning throughout? Yes, sir. So we had a, um, an option was provided to us from the state. It was not mandated that we provide virtual instruction for next year, but it was an option that we had. So in order to prepare and make sure that we prepare for any of the way, this plan had to be submitted at the beginning of June. So we had to go ahead and develop a plan, submit it for the board's approval, get it approved that way. If there wasn't a case where we needed to have a virtual instruction plan, it would already be submitted and approved by the state. And our goal is that all students attend school in a traditional manner, face-to-face. -face. That is our goal, is that all students will be face-to-face -face in the fall. Ms. Erica. I just wanted to mention, Mr. Gentry, um, one of the other reasons we look at a virtual option is there are, uh, there is a small pocket of children that are driving in a virtual environment. And most districts are trying to meet the needs of all children. And so if a child doesn't have a virtual option here, they can go to another district once they follow all those transfer guidelines. And the state also has two virtual schools. So it's also in part to maintain our ADM and keep as many students in our district as possible. Got you. Mr. Terry, before I get your question, Dr. Emanuel, in the committee meeting yesterday, in the committee meeting, did the committee vote go ahead and make this recommendation? 
part when you got to me, I was going to make a motion. Okay, okay. I, I want you to hear everybody. Okay, yes, I just want to make sure of that. Okay. Mr. Terry? So based on, based on the numbers we were provided earlier with the, um, <laughs> the student population that's attending online right now, it looks like about between 45 and 50 percent of our students are currently on, online, you know, or, or have chosen to go um, online. So um, it just seems like if next year, if we're limiting that, you know, that 10 percent, if we're limiting the, the participation to 10 percent, there's going to be there, there could potentially be a gap between, you know, the, they're, they're, we could have more students qualified uh, to participate online than, than, than we have space. So how are we going to, uh, to, to, to justify, or how are we going to make up that gap? We're just going to, uh, I guess principals are, uh, at, they're going to use their discretion to make those sorts of decisions. And if that's the case, then, I mean, what Ms. Erica just said is basically, you know, it just seems like we're willing to just say, okay, well, you can go through the appropriate process and go to another LEA. Then does that mean we lose that ADM? So our, well, one thing, our <coughs> purpose is to make sure that we can meet all of, our, all of our students' needs, and we want all of our students to have a successful educational experience. So when we, look at the, when we were looking at the guidelines that we wanted to put in place for it, we set that 80% guideline when we discussed with principals and, uh, and all of our staff here at Central Office, we noticed that a lot of our kids were kind of failing below that mark. And we wanted to make sure that the students that were achieving in that, if they wanted that option, they could actually obtain it. But when we looked at the numbers of the amount of kids that were below that 80 mark, it was not that half of our kids that would remain virtual. Uh, in other words, you know, our, our, we don't anticipate 11,000 children meeting this criteria. We feel like on average, our 10% would be 2,100 children, and that we won't get to that threshold for those that meet the eligibility requirements. And, and we also have the attendance part built into it as well. It's not just the grade. So the that June 9 deadline, that's a big turnaround. Yes. And even with our high achieving students that possibly could meet these um, requirements, we are still not meeting a lot of their social and emotional needs. They need that interaction and they just can't get that virtually and, and yes i do know some students did um, achieve success virtually but we also uh -oh. know that our children need that interaction let me get mr uh simmons then i'll come back can you can you reiterate about having an adult at home that came up in the meeting yesterday um where it can be the neighbor or something but it can't be a student so for grades four through five, we have the requirement in that that student must have an adult at home to assist them with virtual instruction. The reason for that is you may have technical difficulties where that student may not be able to troubleshoot problems in order to log on to the class and participate as they need be. We put it at 18 and older for an adult um, because we don't want a high school student or a middle school student to be there with that student and it's interfering with their studies as well. Again, with this, even though we're providing the instruction Virtually, we want every student to have the best educational experience possible, and we need to be able to um, separate from being a caregiver and being a student at the same time. Dr. May, I have two comments, and then we have a distinguished committee member. We're going to make a motion. Dr. Williamson, yesterday you made a comment about uh, the virtual high virtual school in a district. Would you make that same comment? I think, and I would say. We have virtual high school, virtual courses that our children can still be enrolled in. It doesn't mean if we say you've got to be face to face, they can still enroll in virtual courses. And many of the high school students that are gifted and very accelerated, they are enrolled in those virtual courses. And anyway, Dr. you had something yesterday I thought was real potent. DPI did provide a choice if a district chose to um, apply for a standalone virtual school with a separate school number. You did have that choice. The window was short. The problem was you did not gain any additional teachers uh, by opening that up. So for instance, if we did have a standalone virtual school, we would not provide a virtual option to any other building. All that would run through that virtual school. Now, um, our intent is, and this is a 90% plan, there's no question of returning students back. There are some kids that have some verified medical needs that need the virtual option, and that's part how we got two to 10%. Uh, 
um, with that piece. But again, it's been mentioned already, the North Carolina Virtual Public School is an, an option. We allotted uh, so many slots, positions for that. Our students do take advantage of that opportunity to do. But we did not apply for it. You've been reading the information. There is a national move uh, not to operate virtual public schools. A lot of states have already passed that mandate. That, that would not happen. Uh, there was a bill, um, is probably still on the floor, that would do the same basically for North Carolina, but no action has been taken on that. Grady, you might know more about yeah, it. I don't think there's any action been taken on the chat either. Right. right. Um, may I continue? Mr. Yesterday, the oh, Christmas meeting, a committee met, and we had a lot of great input by the staff and the superintendent, and a lot of great discussion. And the staff, they've worked really hard to bring together these plans and the superintendent, and we appreciate it. And now we'd like to uh, continue with this motion, and I think Mr. Vontae has it all together. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, make a motion that we accept the virtual instruction plan. Mr. Vontae, second by Mr. Brewer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you for your work yesterday, too. Yeah, good job. Good job. Dr. Williamson. Good job. Mr. Chairman, the board members, I want to recognize principal teachers and district staff. We've heard four outstanding presentations of plans of action. The school extension learning recovery and enrichment program is the top of the line. It has really addressed uh, almost every need that student would have. We can close some that lost learning time if they were attend. If things are in place, and again, it's a ten and a half million dollar investment. But I commend the district staff for the work on that plan. The same holds true for ESSA 2 and 3. We address the learning environment in the building tied to COVID, which is the intent of, 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 of that money. A tremendous amount of money. Uh, Erica will share that dollar amount in a minute. So again, I commend the team that worked on that. The virtual instruction plan, again, is a 90% plan to return our kids back to the building. Um, our buildings are safe. We send to you every week uh, um, our numbers, and I'm on the dashboard, those numbers not changed a lot and continue to follow all protocols on that, on that piece. And it, our mental health plan, but outstanding plans, outstanding work uh, that is very student focused and centered. And if we can get the attendance, we'll make a difference for our students. So I commend the district staff, principal, teachers that spent time and energy putting these plans together. Outstanding work. Amen. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, district mental health plan, uh, Dr. Wendy Dorsey Carr. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Williams, and board members. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about our PSRC mental health plan. In 2020, starting with Title IV, we began to develop a team for district mental health that included members from across the district and across our um, departments to make sure that we had a cohesive team that could look at not only the student needs, but also the staff mental health needs. Then in 2020, of um, June 2020, Session Law 2027 was approved by the North Carolina General Assembly. As a result, each K-12 public school unit shall adopt a plan for promoting student mental health and well-being and for assessing and improving upon the effectiveness of support for the mental health and social-emotional health and substance use needs of the students and staff by July 1, 2021. This mental health plan that we developed had to include a mental health training program and a suicide risk referral protocol. In order to prepare for this, the team has gone through intensive training on mental health. So this team has gone through mental health first aid training, calm training, suicidology training, so that we can take those perspectives of the team members and the training to develop a mission for CSRC. Our mission is that all students are socially, emotionally, and mentally physically healthy so that they're ready to learn and achieve their full potential. As we've heard tonight, there's a lot of different pieces coming up for the upcoming year, and we want to make sure all those mental health needs are addressed through this plan. Okay, next 
So what you'll see, and you've probably seen this many times, um, mental health is also part of MTSS, or the multi-tiered system of support. So what we're looking at when we think about mental health, we're looking at what does every student in our district need in order to be successful when we think of social emotional learning, and also what does every staff member need because we know we both have to have good mental health. In addition, as we think, if this is not enough, what do we do? What supplements do we provide? So that's where the tier two supports come in, and we'll talk about more of these in detail in a few minutes, to add on to what we already provide as a district as a whole. And then, of course, there's some students or staff that may need additional support, and that's where we think of intensive supports. So I wanna talk a little bit about these supports that we're looking at in the district. So as we talked about, tier one is for all students. Every student in the district receives these support. Part of that is also thinking of behavior support. We've always talked about PBIS. That's part of thinking about mental health. How do we address the behavior needs of our students? So this is one piece that's implemented across the district. Another piece we have is evidence-based, practice-based, social, emotional learning opportunities that are included across classes and curriculum. And what you'll see in a few minutes, we have second step that our counselors are currently implementing and two good. Second step is for K-8 and two good is for high school. But we are also gonna talk about expanding that in a few minutes. In addition, we're providing professional development on mental health, PBIS, social emotional learning, and substance misuse to identify staff. And we're also monitoring online behaviors of students through Gaggle, as Ms. Freeman mentioned earlier. There's a lot of data that we're getting through this that can help support us in identifying where our needs and areas go. And then we also have a mental health minute that's being, I'm sorry, being produced on a monthly basis to share more information about mental health. <clears throat> Tier two is then added in addition to this. So if based on the data we see additional needs of our students, then we go a little deeper. This may include school offering evidence-based group or individual interventions through the counselors, social workers, YDS, different groups. But we also at every school have a crisis response team that helps identify where those needs really are and what those needs really are based on the data that we're collecting. We also think about our teachers, so we think about our teachers wellness initiative, and then we also think about employee assistance program and hope for NC. Those are not new things. Those are things that we have already in the district. And then tier three is where it goes a little deeper. Sometimes we have students that have such intense needs that our group cannot support them on their own. And that's where we have to use our collaborative community mental health providers that we have and that we'll share a little information about in a few minutes. Um, in addition, we also have to look at reentry plan for students transitioning back from hospitalization or residential treatment. Do we have students that do come back to us in those situations? And then, of course, each of our schools has a crisis response plan in place in case these things arise. So when you look across the state, um, school district, there's many different providers and, and many different resources that we have, we have been able to actually um, bring together. So for example, we talked about second step. Currently, just our counselors are providing these services, but next year, teachers will also provide second step instruction in the classroom. <coughs> then too good for violence can be done virtually with middle school, but it is focused in high school and also as a social emotional learning curriculum that those people use to help support our students. Then as you've heard, we have Gaggle. Gaggle helps us monitor what's going on with our students. Um, and so we have that elementary through high school. And then PBIS Rewards is just a system that helps gather information about PBIS. And so we have that in all of our elementary and middle schools. And then we're also piling it at Red Springs High School. Um, then you'll notice there's some differences when you go a little for, further. But the Resilience Project is actually a partnership with the state that works with two schools that have been identified, Long Branch and Roland Norman, to provide additional support in developing their skills and understanding of resilience in students. Um, Say Something app has been in existence for several years. That's that self-reporting system, of course, that deals with middle and high school. And then what you'll notice, like we talked about, there's tier one support that everybody needs, but then we have some additional needs at some of our schools based on the data that has come across. And so we have additional partnerships and grants that have allowed us to provide additional supports to a few schools. So CoHealth currently is helping Fairmont or Lumbert Jr. and Townsend, they've just started, but we'll go much deeper next year in providing mental health support as far as 
building leadership, talking about resilience with students, um, drug use, and all those different topics that middle school students deal with. What we know is those things don't disappear as they move to high school. So what we've done is actually have another partnership, and um, I'll have Megan speak about beep and stop bullying, but that is going on at um, Fairmont, Cornell, Sweat, and Lumberton because of the feeder pattern. So we chose those schools so that we can make sure that we're providing support where we see the data highest needs. And so I'm going to let um, Megan just speak about what beep and stop bullying is for a moment. So with our beat program and the stop um, bullying program that's been, we are partnered with the North Carolina Youth Prevention Center with those programs. And they are focusing on students who may be at risk of being bullied or experiencing some of those um, uncomfortable situations. And the counselors and the social workers will recommend these students to these programs after speaking with their parents. Um, some of these programs look like um, virtual paint parties and this program actually provides all of the canvases, the paint brushes, the paint, and they deliver that to the home of the children. And then they participate online on a particular topic that they will paint and then they will talk about those topics. There's also some drama um, reenactments and focusing around bullying topics. Also, they have some mentorship um, partnerships as well with, between the students and licensed um, clinical social so another component of the plan was a requirement for, for professional development to uh, anybody that touches students. So it's school personnel that, who work directly with students, such as teachers, instructional support personnel, principals, and assistant principals, anybody that directly works with students in grades pre-K 13. So if you go to the next slide. So what this requires us to do is next year, every single staff member that we mentioned on the previous slide has to receive six hours of initial training. And this training includes mental health training on defini definition of mental health, national and state statistics, myths and facts, risk factors, protective factors, responding to warning signs and resources. After we do the initial training, every year they have to receive two more hours of training to make sure that we provide them with information that's current. Anybody that gets hired will also have to go through those six hours of initial training. Then what will happen in every even year, starting in 22-23, every person on that list will also have to go through child sexual abuse and human trafficking prevention training on these particular areas, such as best practices from the field of prevention, the grooming and process of sexual predators, the warning signs of sexual abuse and sex trafficking, how to intervene when sexual abuse or sex trafficking is suspected or disclosed, and legal responsibilities for reporting sexual abuse or sex trafficking available resources for assistance. Because we know this is a growing area of concern when we look at districts across the state. So as we talked about, there's a crisis team at each school. These crisis teams also need additional support and training. So we're talking about nurses, social workers, YDS counselors, and so what we're going to do is also provide them additional training on their roles, procedures, and protocols as they change, intervention strategies, and referral and follow-up so that they'll know exactly what to do when an incident occurs. So one thing we wanted to share with you is that based on the data that we've collected over the last few months, what we've seen is that currently suicidal ideation and self-harm is number two in the district. So if you remember in ESSER 2 and 3, we talked about hiring social workers, additional nurses, school psychologists, um, a social emotional curriculum. All of this comes from the needs that we see in the data and what we see happening. So as a result, we have created a suicide risk referral protocol that Megan's going to speak about um, and share a little information about. Good evening, I'm Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, and board members. Good evening. I'd like to thank you in advance for your time. So if you would uh, take a look at the screen, um, this is our suicide risk screening referral process. And I would like to um, for you to look at those first three bullet points I'm going to read to you because I feel like they're very critical before even entering this process. Take suicide behavior seriously every time. No student expressing suicidal thoughts should be sent home alone or left alone during the screening process. 
If there is a reason to believe a student has thoughts of suicide, every effort should be made to avoid sending the student home to an empty house. The risk of suicide is raised when any peer, teacher, or other school employee identifies someone has, as potentially suicide because he, he or she has directly or indirectly expressed suicidal thought or ideation or demonstrated other warning signs. If a student is having thoughts of suicide, there is a suicide risk. If imminent danger exists, contact the site administrator immediately. Phone 911 or the school resource officer immediately and then contact the public schools of Robson County District Mental Health Team for crisis support. This is especially important if the student of concern has skipped school altogether or left campus, is home and a, a plan to attempt suicide is discovered. If imminent danger is not present, but the concern about suicide risk exists, the school counselor, the school social worker, or the school crisis team initiates the screening process. Once this has been identified, we then go into this actual screening process. So our first step is to make sure we locate that child and make sure they're safe. We make sure we get them to a safe, private, location and then once that is established then that person supervises that child until the school counselor social worker or a member of the crisis team can be there to begin that screening process so the if you scroll number two if you look at number two that's a suicide risk assessment checklist this is performed and then based on that information we'll determine do we call east point or do we contact the parent so when we contact East Point, East Point would then send their mobile crisis team out to the school or to the home, wherever that child may be located at. And then they will do a further evaluation beyond ours. So while we're waiting on them, we are continuously doing our evaluation with them and remaining with that child to make sure they're safe. East Point will um, complete their evaluation <coughs> based on their evaluation will determine, does this child need to go to a mental health provider can we do we just need to set up an appointment or does that child need to actually be hospitalized and be evaluated immediately and like i said east point will actually determine that process once that has been done no matter if they are just to, um, set up an appointment with a provider or they go to the hospital a coping plan is put in place for that child um, all PSR documents are completed. An authorization to release an exchange of information is signed by the parent or the guardian, which that allows us to interact with the mental health provider they are put in contact with or with the primary doctor, whomever that child may see. That way we can make sure we establish the appropriate plan in the coping plan. And then if you look at number 10, the support plan that we put in place at the school level. And that is making sure that we are doing everything that we need to do um, at the school level to ensure that child remains safe even when they return to school. Thank you for your time. So as you can see, what we have done is looked at what's the whole child's needs. What can we do to make sure we support everybody's needs? And then what can we do to layer support as we go throughout the process? So we're presenting this plan to share with you to show what we're trying to present to the state as our mental health plan for the upcoming school year to show how we support our students in the district to make sure that they can reach their full potential with academics by providing all these additional supports when we think about their social emotional learning needs and mental health. Good plan. It's a good plan. Any questions? Any questions? Approved, Mr. Chair. Second. second. Motion by Mr. Smith for approval. Second by Mr. Vontae. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. And as uh, Ms. Eric is coming, more people might be leaving. I'd like to reiterate some of what Dr. Williamson said a while ago. Uh, when I got this packet Friday and then, uh, heaven forbid, y'all handed some more stuff here tonight. <laughs> uh, but in, in my five years on this board, this is one of the best pieces of information in a packet that I've received. Uh, there's a lot of work been done by a lot of people. And, uh, and you can tell that and when you go through reading this information and a lot of questions some of us might have when you look through in detail, that question's already been answered. 
So uh, I would just like to thank you, you know, as members of the board and for the school system and more importantly for the children of this county. And especially, like you said, with the summer school thing, you know, we just got to find some way to get the kids there because uh, the plan's in effect and it's in effect for next fall. We're not trying to go virtual next fall. We're trying to get kids in school. That's the reason this plan was written the way it was written, was for kids to come back to school. Now, if there's exceptions, there's exceptions. But the bottom line is to get kids in school because we know that's the best place for them to be in front of a teacher. So again, thank you to all of those that had a part in uh, what we got uh, this past Friday and tonight. And Ms. Erica, you on here for a lot of approval, so go right ahead. Yes, sir. And I, I will try my very best to be brief. Um, our Serenity three-year contract is what our current um, financial software is that we've used in all the years we've been that I've been here at the district. It has changed names several times. I know some of you may have heard me talk about school business modernization and the fact that the state is eventually going to require every district to choose a provider to move into a more modern system. Well, COVID caused that funding to fall through. And for us to convert to one of those modern systems it cost the district a million dollars plus, which we can't afford. So Serenic, our current provider, has restructured our contract and this new contract will save us about $10,000 a year. And we're just bringing that before the board because we are currently in a three-year contract that would end next year. So this starts a new contract because at this point today, we don't know how many more years it'll be before the modernization project can pick up. So we're just asking for approval. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Lawson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Beginning teacher bonus. So the beginning teacher retention bonus is very specific. All the language is on this document. And we're talking about a group of employees who went through, um, and forgive me if I said it correctly, Miss Melissa, help me out. They, they began as some type of lateral entry or resident process. And they have gotten become a teacher, a teacher. And their status as a beginning teacher is listed on this document. And that is the only group of teachers that would qualify. And that um, criteria of who qualifies will be handled by our HR department. I think we're talking about 25 employees. Approved, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Mike Smith, second by Mr. Dwayne Smith. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, employee stipend. The next one is an employee stipend for <coughs> $1,000 for permanent full time and part time employees, classified and certified and it will be prorated for anyone less than 100%. The eligibility would follow the same guidelines as the supplement that we currently pay. So if an individual qualifies for that supplement, they would qualify for the same prorated share of the stipend. This stipend was being paid to employees due to the increased workloads related to challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Employees have been required to take on new tasks in dealing with enhanced cleaning and safety protocols hybrid learning environments, periods of quarantine, and a host of other duties, all while ensuring the safety of our students. We propose paying this stipend on June the 24th to eligible employees. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. That's good. Motion by Ms. Brenda, second by Mr. Gentry. Question, Dr. Emanuel. Yeah, I just want to know, I heard you call some categories, is that you say bus drivers and everybody? Only if they are eligible for the supplement. We only have a very few number of bus drivers that qualify for the supplement. Those that work more than four hours a day. Oh, okay. It would only include those individuals and they can email me, please, if everybody's listening. You send me an email, I will go over in detail the eligibility <laughs> requirements. Terry? One time stipend? This is a one time stipend. Mr. Chairman, why did we uh, choose June the 24th? I mean, what was the logic behind that? That's the pay date for June in anticipation of getting it approved and a workload around uh, getting, making sure summer school payments are processed and getting this done, just the workload of the staff. That was the earliest we felt we could get it out of process. I'm not worried about the earliest. I'm just thinking about, I know everybody wants and like to have it, but I, a lot of these people look, I was just thinking about like December or something like that, you know, Christmas time and stuff like that. I mean. That's kind of what I was 
Thank you. Well, we wanted to make sure that the employees understood um, that we recognize the increased workload that they've had to endure during this COVID year. And that as we've all talked about moving forward into next year, we hope it's a more quote unquote normal situation where these types of COVID um, environments may not be as intense as they have been in this year. So that's the timing to, to show that it was for everything that has occurred during the last year. I think it's good because okay. Chairman. Brenda. I think it's good. Yeah, I think it's wonderful, literally awesome because we did not give them nothing last year, Holly. But this takes care of all of them, so that's great. Mr. Dwayne. Call for the question. It's already done. We had a motion and we had a second. And Mr. Terry, I'll make one comment. This is not just one time this year. This is the first time in history that I know of that we've been able to do something like this. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Ms. Erica, Helmuts. Helmuts. So, um, the last, I think it was the 2012-13 school year, we um, asked the board to place an order for all middle schools and high schools because that was the first year that there was a new requirement where helmets have to be thrown out after 10 years. So there's a running clock on those helmets. So we're coming up on that year, years again, um, and we want to support our schools with everything going on in that year. Second. Second. Motion by Mr. Mike Smith, second by Mr. Lawson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Ms. Erica, budget amendments. I can answer any questions about the budget. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Gentry. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, and folks, right quick before we go to closed session, I just left a paper on your desk about high school graduation. And if I missed something and got it wrong, just see me. We got everything covered. You know, if there been any major adjustments, you can let me know. Uh, and I did get an email today from early college just saying if you go tomorrow, just let them know you're a board member when you get there and they'll have a place for you to go and park. Uh, Mr. Lawson. I move that the Board of Education for the Public Schools of Robinson County go into closed session for the purpose of discussing certified classified personnel, North Carolina Jones Statute 3-318.A1 and 6, and to consult with the attorney retained by the board in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the Board of Education of the Public Schools of Robinson County, North Carolina Jones Statute 143 3 318 1A1 and 3. Second. Motion by Mr. Lawson, second by Mr. Smith. All those in favor say aye. 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 Folks, it's about 6.53. Let's take seven.
Come out of closed session. Be ready, Mr. <coughs> Motion to come out of closed session by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Lawson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, do I have a motion to approve personnel as Thanks, attended? Second. Motion by Mr. Henry, uh, second by Mr. Vontae. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Make such motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Henry, second by Mr. Gentry. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned.